In this lecture, we're going to detail the final value theorem. So I'll begin up, begin with initial, a little bit of initial motivation in the introduction. Then I'll move on to the final value theorem for a discrete time uh, model, which could be open loop or closed loop. And then I've got three examples for us to run through. So after this lecture, you'll be able to understand the use of the final value theorem to determine the final value of the closed loop control system and also the corresponding steady state error. So if you recall back from your continuous time modeling for a closed loop control system transfer function, so your closed loop contr um, control transfer function given by G subscript CL, and then your output from that Y of S being equal to R of S multiplied by that. And a typical example for well, R of S here, we've got a unit step input, and then G subscript CL for the closed loop transfer function given by this second order transfer function here. If we were to take the inverse Laplace of this, we could end up, we would end up with the time solution as you can see here. So the, this Y of S, so in the Laplace, this is our modeling domain for the continuous time system. Inverse Laplace, we're back in the time domain. We could alternatively, if we were in the discrete time domain, we could undertake inverse Z transform to get back to the time solution. But for simplicity, I've just stick, stuck to here initially with the continuous time domain. So what do we get when we, we get the into the time domain? So y of t is equal to, you can see 0 0.5 plus, and then you can see these two exponential terms. So when in steady state, the leading coefficient details the final value of the system. So this value here effectively details the final value of the system when in steady state. So if I look at this graphical response down here, what we've got here is a reference on the closed loop control system, a value of one. So effectively our reference is a unit step input. And then we've got our output here in red. The transient part of the system response is whereby you've got effectively a rate of change. We've got dynamics going on in terms of the system response. Then when you've got no change in terms of the system response, that's the point whereby you're in steady state. Hence, as I said before, when in steady state, the leading coefficient details the final value of the system. So the final value of the system is going to be 0 0.5 when we're in steady state. And hence, you can see a value here of 0 0.5. The final point I'll make of interest is the steady state error. So steady state error is the difference between the final value of the system and what we actually desired in terms of the, um, in terms of the control systems, the reference. In this case, it being a value of 1. So in this particular case, because we desired a value of 1 and our output was measured to be 0 0.5, we've got a steady state error of 50%. So in terms of the, the final value theorem, rather than undertaking inverse Laplace or inverse Z transform, what we can do is apply this theorem to determine the final value of the system when in steady state. So the final value of the system when we did inverse Laplace, we just determined was 0 0.5, as you can see here. What we can do instead is just use the final value theorem and we can use this both to open loop and to closed loop control systems. It makes more sense though for the closed loop control system or closed loop feedback control system because what we're interested in that in the closed loop control system is achieving kind of the reference and then the final value theorem can be used to examine the steady state error. So we've got a difference between the reference and the measured output. So in terms of what does the final value theorem look like? So it looks like this equation here. So equation 3, 1. So the limit of f of n, where n is the number of samples, is equal to the limit of, and then brackets, z minus 1 multiplied by y of z. As n goes to infinity, so the number of samples goes to infinity, z become 1. So what this this is similar to, you know, when we were in the continuous time domain, if you recall, whereby when time went to infinity, the S's went to zero or approached zero. And if you recall, the reason why this holds is because D by DT, which is effectively the, is the rate of change in terms of this. So you think when we're in steady state, the rate of change becomes zero and s is effectively d by dt so when there's no rate of change that's why we replace in the continuous time we replaced all the s's with zero okay and t approaching infinity that's because we just want to say infinity because when we're in effectively in steady state so the theorem here is very very similar 
However, rather than when we work out y of z, which is the output, and we saw that on the previous equation, so if we go back, here you can see y of s, obviously in our case it'd be y of z, but similar form of the equation, so it'd be r of z multiplied by the closed loop transfer function in the, in the z domain, y of z, what we effectively do is just replace all the z's in that with one, and then just simplify it, and we'll end up with a with a with a value, a term. And you'll see this when we go for an example in a minute. What you need to be aware of though is this z minus one as well. So don't forget that there. So what I've got here is an example, just to kind of get it as into using the final value for them. So a closed loop control system, so G subscript CL for closed loop of Z has a proportional control gain of 1 and a reference of 1. Okay, it has a reference of 1, if you remember in the time domain, reference of 1, continuous time, 1 over s, discrete time, z over z minus 1. And it has a system modelled by this transfer function here, this discrete time second order transfer function here. What I want to do is determine the final value of the system and comment on the steady state error. So what I'm going to initially do is write out the final value theorem. So you can see the equation given here that you saw on the previous slide. As I said to you, what we need to first of all work out is work out what y of z is. So y of z is equal to r of z, where r of z is effectively our reference. So we had a reference of 1, and we know in time domain that's 1, and in discrete time that is z over z minus 1. And hence you can see here r of z, z, r, um, y of z is equal to r of z, y of z is equal to, now you can see the unit step input for a discrete time modelled there. And then here you can see this here is, is effectively g subscript cl of z, and you can see kp, where we know our kp is 1, hence you can see kp1 there, and there's kp there, so kp there. n of z, which is just the numerator of this open loop system, so this is effectively equal to, which is that, n over z over d of z. So you can see here, n of z is that, and that's just being there. d of z, so it's the, it's the denominator here, so you can see that there, plus, as I said, kp, and then d of z, um, sorry, n of z again here, which is the numerator here, which you can see again, the numerator over there. So that's all been... Um, applied there and then you can see on this line here I've simplified it and that's pretty much there our equation to use the final value theorem. So if we apply the final value theorem so here I've just taken this part of the equation you can see that there and then y of z however now we've just determined because it's given by this here I've substituted that in down here I've substituted that in down here for y of z. So what I'm going to do is replace all these z terms here, so this one, this one, this one, this one, this one. I'm going to replace them all with, as you can see, with 1s. And also recall the z minus 1 that was given up here, so the z, and that's there. And then just replace the z with 1. I'm then just going to simplify that. So this term here, in terms of the denominator, this term here, plus this term, that gives me a value of 0 0.2733. 1 squared, take away... Um, minus 0 0.3034 plus 0 0.1233 gives me a value of this. Then the final value in this case is 1 over 3. So we've put a unit step input into the system, so that's our reference, that's what we desire. And what we've got in this particular system is 1 over 3. Therefore, the system, well, the system or the closed loop control system is subject to a unit step input. The final value, when we're in steady state, yss, so for steady state is equal to 1 over 3. So the steady state error can be determined because it's effectively just 1 take away 1 over 3 times by 100. So the steady state error is 66.6%. So in terms of looking this on a graphical output, we've got time and amplitude. You can see there your reference or unit step input, and you can see your final value of the system, which in this case is 1 third, and then your steady state error of 66.6%. So a further example, what we're going to do in this example now is we're going to explore the effect of the proportional control gain on the system response. So we're going to use the previous example 
that you can see. So if you'll recognize these numbers from one of the previous, uh, from the previous slide. However, we're now going to keep KP as a variable. We're going to apply the final value theorem to this. So as we did previously, we applied the final value theorem. So you can see here, previously I didn't say, but you could effectively just cross these two out because they, they effectively cancel. Apply the final value theorem, work out the sum of that, work out the sum of this, and you'll get this here. What you could do, you could further simplify this, I guess, but it's it's you could add these two terms, you could add these two terms together here, but it's it's fine for now. So if we consider the the previous example where kp is equal to one, and we got a, a value of one third. So if you just put there again one, obviously simplify it, you get a third as we saw on the previous slide. Then what we want to do is obviously because now we're, we're we are exploring the effect of the proportional control gain. What we can put in here now is values here and here is values of 10. So you can see here and also values of 25. So if you put in values of 10 and 25, then work out the math. So multiply that across, multiply that across, simplify it for 10 KP of 10, you'll get five over six KP of 25, you'll get 25 over 27. And what we can do as we did previously, we can work out the steady state errors. So E subscript SS. So error or in steady state are determined to be these values. So what you'll notice as as the as the proportional control gains increased, the final value of the system's increasing and the steady state error is decreasing. I.e. the difference between the reference, what you desire, and the system output is getting smaller. And we can represent this on a graph here. So you can see here the one that the graphical output you saw previous, you've got your reference of one. And then you can see the green, so for 10, KP is equal to 10, and then KP is equal to 25. And you'll notice, as I just said, as you increase the KP, what's happening is the steady state error is increasing. However, what you will notice is that the system response it now has this um, oscillation here or overshoot. So that's, that's kind of a downfall. So you can increase your proportional control gain and reduce steady state error but it will introduce some oscillation on the system response. So in practice, the proportional control gain is actually in fact limited by the actuator specification. And that's something we'll see when we get onto the embedded control system lectures, or you'll see when you get onto the embedded control system lectures. So example three, so I've got one final example, and this is based on the previous lecture example, you know, the water tank example we looked at where we had, well, we had that, that's the standard transfer function. We had this transfer function here for G subscript CL for the, the closed loop transfer function. When we had this, we can see here, we've got this variable KP. Um, our reference here is one over S and just note we're at the moment, this is all in continuous time domain. So what I've done, well, well what, I'm, what, I'm, what I've done here is I've got KP is equal to 5, KP equals 10, KP equals 15. So I've got three different proportional control gain values. Y of Z is equal to, okay, if you remember R of S, or R of Z, sorry. So R of S, 1 over S in the continuous is equal to Z over Z minus 1, as we said previously, hence this here. And then what I've done is I've substituted in 5 into there. So KP is a value of 5 and also into there. Then I've used MATLAB C to D on this um, closed loop trans function with a sample interval of 1. And I've got a closed loop trans function given by that. And that's when also we saw in the previous video. I then applied the final value theorem. So you can see here the limit um, effectively all the values approaching 1. Again, you can cross that out. Simplify it and you'll get the final value, of the system being 0.553. We do exactly the same process. So in here, rather than substitute in 5, substitute now in 10. Discretize this using MATLAB. You could do it using the tables of transform. It's completely up to you. Tables of transform and MATLAB with a sample interval of 1. And then we end up with this discrete time transfer function here. Apply the final value theorem. Effectively, those two cancel. And then you'll end up there with a final value in the system being 0 0.7142. And again, do exactly the same thing now with 15. So 15, discretize this, use the tables of transform, which you can use, or use MATLAB C to D, and you'll end up with that discrete transfer function for the closed loop system there. 
and obviously each case because R of S multiplied by G subscript CL. Apply the final value theorem. Again, we can just cross them out, simplify this, and you'll end up with this term here, so 0 0.7895. So what you're noticing as we increase the proportional control gain, you'll notice the steady state error again is decreasing. So it's a common effect. This, so if you're kind of effectively the proportional control gain is putting more power into the system, so it's kind of obvious that you'd expect the steady state error of the system to decrease. You'll notice in this particular case here that we have the um, we have the 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 um, you notice in this particular case that we have the the system has no overshoot, and that's because this is a first order trans function, so we won't expect to get any overshoot. Okay, the previous example was second order, so we would, as we increase proportional control gain, expect to get overshoot. But first order, if you look, think back to continuous time, it won't, you won't get any kind of oscillation on the system response. Okay, and that kind of makes sense for a water tank not to have oscillation. So in summary, we've looked at the operation of the final value theorem that's been detailed, and we've also used the final value theorem to investigate the effect of the proportional control system control gain on the system output. So we know as we increase the proportional control gain, the steady state error is going to decrease, but for a second order system it's going to likely it's going to well, it's going to introduce more oscillations on the system response. But in practice the value you can actually use the proportional control gain is actually in fact limited. So next steps we're going to look at the Z plane. So if you have any questions please feel free to email me. Thank you.